Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. I have the honor of having, you know, we don't know what he does all day, guys. I'm not going to lie to you. We, he's an Airbnb maverick. Uh, Michael Elefante, how you doing, my man? I'm good, Austin. I'm really good. Thanks for having me on. You got it, man. Before we get started, I just want to thank uh, Dream Chasers as our sponsor. Go out and check out that podcast. It's amazing. So what I like to do with my guest is... Let them kind of tell their story where they want to, and I'll let you run from there, my man. Yeah, so just quick background on me. I grew up as an athlete, played baseball through college, Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do out of school, so got into tech sales, kind of worked my way up the corporate ladder a little bit, Um, led me to some fun cities to live in and experience with my now wife, Um, so Dallas, then Austin, and now Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we always knew that we had interest in real estate, just didn't quite know how to get started. Um, so long story short, we started networking with a ton of people, learned about long-term rentals, short-term rentals, um, all sorts of different strategies. And then being in Nashville, it was such a hot tourism market, ultimately got into the short-term rental market um, and listed you know, a couple different places on Airbnb. That started growing quickly. Then COVID happened, set us back, and now we're picking back up and um, looking to do uh, real estate investing full time. Um, and then in addition to that, got into doing some content creation on YouTube and TikTok. And that's just been a lot of fun and taking that a lot more seriously now. So kind of got our hands in all sorts of different areas, but um, it's sort of all centered around real estate, specifically uh, Airbnb. And what was the driving force for you to, I mean, a sales job, it, it can be some good money. What was the What was the driving force for you to to pivot and look for a different alternative. Yeah, that's a great point. I think when I was younger and it's probably similar to a lot of people's mindsets is how do I make the most money? Um, And and when we started to make, you know, pretty good money and we were both in sales, uh, I think we quickly realized that um, living a fulfilling life for us didn't really have anything to do with money. So it became more about having money be the tool and the avenue to um, increasing the amount of time that we have. So started to learn more about what streams of passive income we could create. And obviously you hear a lot about real estate in terms of passive or relatively passive income. So the goal for us is to create um, more time to do what we want and money is just kind of the tool to get there. And real estate has been, um, you know, the main main tool, I guess, um, or investment tool that that, that we've used to get to this point. What was the first investment that you did? What did it look like? First investment was uh, a short-term vacation rental in Nashville. It was actually a new build and a development with 11 houses that were all short-term rental uh, zoning, like permitted for Nashville. Mm-hmm. They have rules. And so we were pretty nerve wracking and we, we put an offer on the house, negotiated and we closed and then realized that we didn't, you know, we didn't know much at first. So we didn't really budget for, the appropriate amount of furnishing costs to, to mm-hmm. furnish a full four bedroom house. So I ended up selling my dream truck that I had paid off about a year before, um, which was totally fine with me traded in for just a little Honda CRV super base model, but it got the job done and took that cash to help furnish the house and can, you know, keep our emergency savings, you know, padded enough. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. so, <laughs> so, so how old were you when you sold your truck? I sold it at 26. That's hard to do. You know, it's funny enough. You didn't know this about me. Uh, I had my dream Jeep uh, that I was making a bunch of money. We did our taxes and I had no money in the bank. And I said, where's all the damn money? And I looked, I started doing the math that it was between two cars, insurance, parking. It was like 1800 bucks. Right. And so that day broke my heart in half. We sold at all that stuff. And I rode the bus for two years. Wow. Um, But that gave me like 30 G's. uh, And, and that's how I got my first investment. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think 
quickly realizing, um, and I'm a big rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki fan. He's a little bit of an extremist to some extent, but I get, I like his message. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me learning about the true difference between assets and liabilities and how, how we're, we live in a society where we're almost trained as a consumer and to just purchase liabilities, get a promotion, make more money, purchase more liabilities because we deserve it. And there's some truth to that. Like you want to be able to afford nicer things as you are successful in your career. But then I had them started to learn more about, well, what if we instead put that money toward an asset that puts money into our pocket every month? And what if those assets pay for all the liabilities in life? So that was like a big aha moment for me when I finally understood that when I was a little younger. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, we made that decision to get in the real estate, sell the truck and all that stuff. So this new construction zoned Airbnb stuff is something I'm starting to see. I, definitely in Florida. I've got a couple of friends that invest in there. Um, what made you and your wife decide to go down the Airbnb route? Did you do some investigating beforehand? What, what intrigued you about the, uh, the model? So the thing that intrigued us the most was the cash flow potential was significantly higher in most cases if you make the right investment in the right market than a traditional long-term rental, especially with the price of real estate um, skyrocketing the past few years, especially in 2020, there's a supply being so low. Uh, it, it's become very difficult to find a good deal um, to cash flow. And for us, it was like, what's the fastest path to financial freedom? Meaning, you know, we have enough, uh, you know, uh, relatively passive income or residual income to pay for our you know, monthly expenses. And I quickly realized that if we could get one to three properties that do very well, we could reach financial freedom just with three properties or two properties, which was, which was amazing, you know? Um, instead of doing the traditional long-term rental where you save up 20% down, save up 20% down and maybe 200 bucks a door, the traditional method, which is nothing wrong with that. It was just, my mind was like, it could be faster if you get in a good market. Um, and it's not that hard if you automate a lot of the, the processes and the management side. This is the most important conversation of the whole thing, because I say this every time I do an Airbnb talk. Nobody understands this. What is the first thing they say to you? They probably say to you, they say to me, I want 200 Airbnbs. And I'm like, no, you don't. Like, <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, yeah. Three to five to six is, is plenty. So yeah. walk us through, I rarely do this on my podcast, but I know you're a guy that knows your numbers. Walk us through step-by-step step, that first deal, kind of what it looked like. You know, obviously you probably the first go around you paid in some places you probably didn't need to, but what is, so what was the, if you don't mind sharing, what was the house? Uh, what was the cost? It's a four bedroom house. I think it was around 2,200 square foot has a rooftop. So it had the image we wanted to be kind of have that sex appeal on Airbnb because it's an emotional decision in the bachelorette parties, birthday parties, a lot of special occasions. Um, it was listed at 495. I think we closed at 495 and we got the seller to pay for some of our closing costs and we did 15% down. And the interest rate was actually the worst interest rate we've had on any of our deals, but it was like a 499, but the numbers still made a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. um, then we figured out a ballpark. I'm very conservative when I'm forecasting both occupancy and um, average nightly rate plus our operating expenses. So just built a spreadsheet that I've tweaked over the years and, and it worked. I mean, the numbers made sense. Um, the biggest thing is the revenue numbers um, coming from the occupancy you know, number of nights booked per year plot multiplied by the average daily rate, which is the hardest thing to predict in Airbnb. What were you, what were you forecasting for? So we're for, we were forecasting occupancy around 60% in Nashville. That was pre COVID. It was like 65, 70%. Actually Nashville is one of the hottest markets and highest mm -hmm. occupancy for any city. Um, and so the revenue we were forecasting was a baseline of like 75 to 80, a lower tier, if you know, I usually do like a lower tier, most likely value and a high tier and the higher tier is like over a hundred grand, which I think we're going to cross in 2021 just from revenue, which is great. So our total expenses for the year forecasted to be after cleaning fees, probably like 55 to, to 60 grand. Mm -hmm. So that was the aha moment for me when I started to break down the numbers. And one of the most common questions I get from people about Airbnbs is, oh, it's too expensive. You'll never make any money that place will sit vacant. I'm like, it really won't if you just <laughs> understand the market and how the numbers work. Um, Cause that place, if it was a long-term rental may cash flow a couple hundred bucks a month, just cause mm -hmm. of the expensive on an Airbnb though, we're cash flowing on a good month, like four to six grand a month on a not so good month, maybe one to two grand. 
So this is the rub. And I was just talking to three people yesterday who are looking to spend almost 800 to a million two on an Airbnb. And I said, listen, if your property is cash flowing four to 600 bucks regular long-term, don't do Airbnb. Now, if you can get that above a thousand to 1200 and go up higher than there, it's a, it's a, it's a, not only for the tax depreciation value uh, and then writing off stuff, it's that's when you start seeing financial freedom when you yeah. can, when you can generate those numbers. Yeah. And for me, it's not necessarily the cash flow number, obviously the bigger, the, the better, because it's it, per property, it's one less to manage. I'd rather have a bigger property than three smaller properties, just because it's, it almost takes the same amount of time to manage one bigger property as it does one small property. Um, but the bigger thing for me is just the cash on cash return and total return on investment. How hard is each dollar working for me? Because okay. if, if you get a, a million dollar house, that cash flow is five grand a month and the cash on cash is 12%. Why wouldn't I just sit that in a multifamily house where I don't have to do anything? Right. I mean, there's no, exactly. Point. That's why I told him, I said, why yeah. would you, I said, why would you make your money work so hard? Yeah, exactly. So, but if you can get, I mean, usually when I'm looking at properties, I'm aiming for over a 30% cash on cash return, 25% minimum. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm you're very stick, stickler about the numbers because like, you know, this, I mean, if the numbers make sense, the deal makes sense. It's hard to sometimes to strip away the emotion behind any type of investment or purpose. <laughs> so what, I, what I've been teaching myself and something I'm, in, I'm, I'm knee deep in right now, mm -hmm. I have a couple of friends who work for big institutions, $5 billion dollars. And I've been studying behavioral investing and I'm trying, you know, we have a second podcast that we're releasing next month, all about stoicism and psychology of success with Anthony Fasano, who's a multifamily guy and just this neutral way of thinking. And I was, I interviewed a guy yesterday in England who has, he manages 120 Airbnbs and he made a rule that once he closes the deal or buys it or closes the manager, he, he never will go in the property because he has set up a, a numbers metric dashboard and he doesn't want to have any emotion tied to the asset. So he's literally looking at reviews, the numbers and going, that property is not performing. Here's how we can tweak it. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm learning. It's like, it's amazing how many decisions we're making based off of pure emotion. And it's not an actual tangible um, real estate transaction. You're, you're, it's an emotional transaction. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's a, so did you clean that one yourself? Did you hire a cleaner? How did the first one go? Yeah, no, we, we have cleaned them ourselves only when there was a, an issue between cleaning companies, if we were transitioning from one to a new one, but we try to never clean and try to outsource as much as possible. Because in, in, in theory, you're setting it up for you to eventually fire yourself from your business, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, we want to be, we want to make it as hands off as possible because it can be really easy to think to yourself, well, I could save a couple hundred bucks a turn by cleaning myself, but you're going to spend four hours in that house. And I'd rather spend four hours elsewhere doing more strategic work. You know, do you, so. do you remember your first booking that you got? Do you remember? Yeah. Oh, this is a great story. So yeah, so yeah I remember mine. Today. So yeah, we listed it two days before my birthday. And on my birthday, we got our first booking and we were so nervous and so jazzed up. Person had no profile picture, no reviews. They just joined like that day on Airbnb and they booked for a month and they got, we had our pricing low cause we yep. were just trying to get some people in there, get reviews and they got a major discount cause we have monthly just No one ever books a month. And so we were super sketched out. I actually met the guy at the house before he checked in just to see what it was about. It ended up being a group of um, not foreign exchange students, but they were on some type of special visa where they can come to the United States and study and also work. So they were working mm -hmm. for an, an aquatic management company doing like lifeguarding and things like that. And none of the younger folks spoke English, which was fine. But the guy who booked it wasn't actually staying in the house, which is against Airbnb rules drastically. But mm -hmm. it was they were checking in that day. We said, okay, as long as everything's fine, that, that'll, it'll be cool. We scheduled a mid a mid stay clean that we were going to pay for out of pocket because it was brand new, just furnished. And it was the house was so messy, the cleaners couldn't even clean. So they left and they, there was a language barrier. So when they checked out, the place looked like it had been lived in hard. I mean, there wasn't any significant damage, but it was dirty. It was messy. And they ransacked all of the incidentals that we left out. And that we don't do this anymore, but we left out like a giant, like 
two huge things of coffee, a bunch of K cups. They had, they took like 800 servings of coffee. They took all of the dish pods and laundry pods, everything, all the toilet paper. And so we find the guy like 450 bucks because we did all the math and minus normal wear and tear stuff. And, and he paid us immediately and was very apologetic, but I'll never take a booking like that again. <laughs> it was wild. It's, 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 you know, what's funny. That's happened to me about three times. Really? Like that, that whole thing. They seem to always get you on the first booking and they book for 45 days or 30 days. They get a huge discount. Um, we had to redo the carpets. I mean, it was a whole oh thing. God. Yeah, dude. Wow. It's, it, it, you know, what's interesting. I'd love to hear your philosophy before we continue on your story. Cause this is what people ask me all the time. How do you feel about long-term stays in Airbnb? The goal for us is two to three day stays. Mm-hmm. Why uh, is that? Our, because there's less discounts. Um, and there's less wear and tear. And usually if, if in Nashville, they're there to go see the live music and have a good time on Broadway, grab some drinks, and then come back and plop their head on a pillow. Mm-hmm. So for us, if it's a longer term stay, they're actually going to live in the place. And that's where I've seen wear and tear. Even in long term rentals, I think there's more wear and tear than tr- sometimes than Airbnbs, because Airbnbs are professionally cleaned every turn. But long term stays, I try to avoid unless it's a smaller unit. And, and we're going to just have it book solid for 30 or 45 straight days. And it may be two to four people, but mm-hmm. some of our places are bigger. I don't want 12 people staying for 45 days. That place is just going to get trashed in the mountains. It's a little different. We shoot for three to seven day long stays. Mostly. Yeah. And it, it, there's only so much damage they can do in 48 hours. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, but, it, it, but it's, it's, it's a double edged sword, right? Because I had a smaller place, a two bed, you know, a two bedroom, six people that always got booked for a long time. It, it comes and goes, you know, I mean, you know, I was, uh, I have a friend um, who lives in Sacramento who does a couple Airbnbs. He's a e-commerce guy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> he just got a booking the other day. He arbitrage rents in downtown San Diego in a high rise. Mm-hmm. Um, 42 days, $17,000. So it's like, I'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. yeah. I, have, I have found that the, the, this is going to sound kind of weird, but the more you're able to charge, usually yes. the people, no. look at it, one, they keep it cleaner Two, They don't complain as much. Which is the weirdest thing? Usually, Michael, uh, I can't I give you. I, I can't give away my secret. This is why we went to luxury, bro. This yeah, is why we went to luxury. Whenever coronavirus came and there was shutdowns, we tanked our price and tried to accommodate longer stays. Mm-hmm. And even the people that came for just weekends that were still visiting Nashville for whatever reason, I mean, it was like a third of the price. One, they were still asking for discounts, which usually people mm-hmm. don't ask for discounts when it's more expensive. And then they would complain about every little thing in the reviews. They were sticklers. People who pay a thousand dollars a night to stay there they don't say anything and they leave us a great review almost every time. It's so, it's so backwards in my mind. You would think if someone's paying a lot of money, they would find like the, there's a tiny spot that's not clean in the house. And I'm going to complain because I'm paying so much, but it's. Backwards. So this is a psychology of service. This is something I study on the regular with my coaching, with my businesses. There is a threshold that your business can get to when people deem it as, you know, the value and so what I found in my market, especially in San Antonio, where my personal houses are, is there's a million houses that are 200 bucks a night. And so people are picking your house of five to $10. The moment, the moment you give a discount, they're asked for another one, guaranteed. Yeah. And so you have to set your parameters of what you're doing and you have to have an abundant personality and abundant mindset to know that there's all, dude, I can't tell you how many times I had a huge booking cancel and then an hour later, boom, another booking right behind it. I can do it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the funny story, true story. My smallest property, we had no bookings. I'm dead serious. No bookings at no, November 30th. No bookings in December. None. I booked 98% on the month and we did like $9,000. Wow. You, you, Airbnb does this. You have to just know that you're good where you are and know that it's going to book when necessary. Yeah. Now, something like COVID, that's a different story. So when you started getting those bookings and that money's in your account, I'm sure there was a lot of light bulbs that went off to get that second property. Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly. Um, we put together some money and um, you know, moved, moved some actually of some of retirement accounts too, because we were seeing the returns we were getting. 
um, and got another property pretty quickly in Nashville. And then the bit, the best property that we got was actually a mountain house, which was uh, in the fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. And the mountains are just going crazy in Tennessee. Gatlinburg was just rated number one tourist. It's it's the number one. It's the number one Airbnb market in the country. There's no. Yeah. There's no. There's no. Pfizer just ranked them number one in 2021 for like the most sought out destination to visit and number five in the world, which surprised me. But I mean, the publicity is unreal and everything's growing here. So, and this is why we were do here now, flipping a second house, getting it ready for Airbnb in the next few weeks. So walk us, so you're, so this is outside of your market about three hours, four hours. Walk us through how you identified that market and, and why you decided to, what that look, what that project looked like. Yeah, so I learned about the market, I think, on listening to Bigger Pockets and found a, a realtor group out here um, that has been in the market doing primarily all short term rentals, uh, house sales. And so they know their stuff and they're great. They're the short term shop. And so just started punching in numbers. And some of it was a little misleading, like AirDNA is, is a little misleading. And I started networking with other investors and they were telling me the real returns and the real occupancy they were seeing. And I was like blown away. So we identified, we went through multiple properties um, waiting for like the right one because the market is, is pricey. So we we're looking for a place that just needed a little bit of cosmetic work and was passed up by other investors. So we got a place that I felt was at a discount relative to what it could do from a revenue perspective. And I mean, it worked out great. We just decorated the place really nice, new paint, just kind of made it a little different because a lot of the houses here look like grandma's cabin. They're all two in the same when you're scrolling through photos. I think a lot of Airbnb markets are like that. Everyone kind of falls into like that category, same decor, same furniture. So we wanted to be a little different, a little more modern, rustic. And I actually accidentally published a listing on Airbnb because I was onboarding a new uh, property management software tool. And I had like 10 inquiries in five minutes <laughs> and we booked like 10 grand in the first three days. And that place is that one place we were financially free from that one house in November. So I just talked to my buddy in Dubai yesterday. He owns a bunch of properties, a big time lawyer about to move back to the States. He bought a property in Gatlinburg uh, that was underperforming. Same like you said, shitty, you know, all the things he bought new furniture, redid the photos, changed a couple things. He told me that property did uh, 25, 30,000 in December. I, I believe it. Yeah. And so it's like, fucking Jesus. So, what what does that property cost, and then what is it doing per month? So we got it at five fifty, and between furniture, it had some furniture that came with the house. Um, between furniture and the rehab, we spent fifty grand all in. So six six hundred k, I guess you could say all in. We didn't buy it cash. Um, and in November, we grossed I think over fourteen grand in revenue and netted over nine. And then in December, we grossed over twenty thousand and netted over thirteen in cash flow. Which you was, own that. You own that with just you and your wife, or yeah. So, and then I just saw y'all close on one you, that looked like you partnered up with somebody, correct? We did, yeah. So this is an awesome story in Nashville. It's on the east side of town. It's you know gentr gentrified, or it's happening. I used constantly. to live there. I forgot. To oh, really? that. Yeah. Oh, where? Uh, actually, Donaldson. Uh, okay. And funny enough, I forgot to tell you, are you in town uh, May 14th, 15th? Maybe. We're well, having a, we're having married that weekend. Yeah, we're having my biggest meetup of the year in Nashville. We got huge oh. developers and everybody were renting out a, a, a bar Friday night. So if you're oh. in town. Yeah, that would be awesome. Keep me posted on that. I'm going to have you speak about Airbnb, bro. <laughs> I'll do it. Um, but yeah, so this. The, the house across the street from us, you know, it was, it was an old, old house. Um, as soon as it sold, we knew it was going to be a teardown and, you know, two, two houses are going to be built on the same lot. And so the builder who built those houses came over and introduced himself and we just hit it off and became, you know, very friendly with each other. And then after the houses were done, several months later, we started talking more about Airbnbs and he said, Hey, I'm interested if you have an opportunity you'd like to partner on. And it was like a, a perfect marriage and like an investing partnership because he has a unique skill set that we don't have. I mean, being a home builder. So working with his own contractors, other contractors out here, we wanted to find a place that needed quite a bit of work, a little more involved than our last couple. 
Um, so he could manage more of the rehab and handle that budget. My wife and I were going to furnish the house and then we're going to manage the property and we're going to split everything 50, 50 from the cost to the cash flow. So, it was, it so you're going to, so work. you're going to forego your management fee and just take, if you, if you were to be a manager, you're going to forego that. Who, who did y'all both 50, 50 on the, on the down payment or, or 50, their 50, hand? Yep. Everything, all costs involved. So down payment, closing costs and um, all the investment costs. Um, so, so if I'm understanding to explain to the, the audience, you're, you're not only going to catch money on the refi as you've added value there, but you're also going to generate cash flow, and then plus everything is a write-off. So it's like you're actually hitting like money like three different times. Yeah. And this was, we knew it was like a pretty unique investment where the after repair value is going to be significantly higher because we're adding around seven or 800 square foot, converting the garage to a theater room. And we were surprised. The, we got it at 499 and we got the seller to pay for most of our closing costs. And the house was appraised at 575. So we got okay. 76 grand equity right off the bat. And based on the added square footage and the other work we're doing, the after repair value would probably be around 700. So big time equity grab, which some of the other houses we have wasn't necessarily an equity grab. And like you said, then the cash flow is the main thing uh, with the house and attractant uh, money wise. So it was like a win, win, win scenario. Um, so the reason, you know, I didn't want to propose doing a, a co-hosting or property management fee, cause I normally would charge probably 20 to 25% to do that. Um, he's adding a ton of value managing the rehab. So if we can add that much in equity, I was like, yeah, we'll just split everything 50, 50. And we already have a system in place. We can automate most of it. So it was no big deal on our end. No, for sure. I love that. And, um, so Man, dude, you are rocking and rolling. And it, it seems like you've kind of found your groove on what you bring to the table. What is two two things? Um, how surprised, I want to talk about this for a minute. How surprised were you how quick you could be financially free? And then what was that moment like? Did you, you know, my thing with people is I don't think they actually put it on paper how much money they need to live. And once you put it on paper and work backwards, you can get there really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's that statement couldn't be truer. And I talk about this a lot with my buddy, Mike Riley. Um, we have like a weekly talk cause he's in real estate as well doing uh, Airbnb. And we're like, what's your number? Cause it's something we hadn't really thought about. It's like, I want to be financially free. And we both still work for W2 paying jobs right now, but when is kind of the moment that we're just going to fully transition out? Cause it's really, really easy to just continue to do that and collect that money and use that money to invest. When do you just completely part ways? And I just read the book, The Psychology of Money, I think it's called. Yes, I knocked it out Great last book. week. It's yeah. amazing, amazing book. Yeah, and the thing that really stuck with me was <clears throat> two things. Like, what, what is your number? Like, when is enough enough? Because you see these people making millions and billions, and it's never enough. And maybe at that point, it doesn't really become about money. I don't know what it is for, for people, but it's like the psychology of it. So like you said, tying a number to it, helps you kind of just get to that point. And then, like I said, at the beginning of the podcast for my wife and I, it's, it became a lot less about money and more about time. So when we begin to start a family and want to, we love to travel. So the goal for us is freedom of time. Once we get to a certain point, we just want to enjoy our life um, to the best of our ability and be able to give back to local communities or, or whatever, you know, we just want to be able to live beyond our wildest imaginations and also like give beyond our wildest imaginations. Why I appreciate the mindset that you're at, because you're exactly what I preach, is that you're doing everything necessary to create the time. So so here, what I try to tell every young person I meet, you are doing every day the things necessary to benefit more time available for your future family. Like you're actually going to be able to wake up and go, you know, I don't feel like it. Like well, I'm going to hang out with my kids today. And so every day that you're not creating passive income, every day that you're not planning or putting things in your place, you're taking minutes and time away from your future kids. Yeah, and that's a great, great perspective. And I talked to a kid the other day, right? He's uh, 20, 23. And I said, when, if you invested right, I said, when would you want to retire? Like, when do you see yourself getting to the place you need? He said, 45. I said, bullshit. I said, I said, I can get you there in seven years at 30. You could be done at 30. And he was like, 
well, that just changes everything. And I'm like, yeah, it does change everything because it's true. It's true. it's possible you could do it in, in a year and a half. Like, yeah. yeah, but, but, but you have to have it on paper. You got to know where you're getting to. You got to be surrounded by the right people. You got to be, they got to be getting the right people in your corner to push you. And so what you've done, right. <laughs> and I want to get into this for a minute, what you've done with your content and what you've done with surrounding yourself by the right people is you've positioned yourself as a leader in a, a niche, right, which is Airbnb financial freedom, where people come to you, I would imagine, for advice. And then also that in turn allows people that want to partner with you on deals because you made yourself like my favorite quote in the world. Like one of my favorite quotes is either position uh, position yourself or you will be positioned. It's a good one. And so, I mean, wouldn't you agree that that's what the content has done is kind of made you and you're not talking about anything that you haven't done personally. And that's key, too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the content stuff, like originally I was like, I love YouTube and I use it all the time. Change, change a light bulb, learn how to do something around the house. You know, I YouTube it. That's the first thing I do and started to learn about ways to monetize on YouTube, which, you know, was part of the driving factor was if I could make money creating content and talking about stuff that I love to talk about, like similar to what you're doing right now, it was like, that would be awesome. Um, and then you're on your own schedule. You can do it whenever you want. But the coolest thing that has come from all that is what you said, which is random people I've never met reaching out or networking. And now there's like, I get a couple people every week saying, Hey, I'd love to partner with you on a deal. Like I have money, just want want your advice or whatever. We can bring something to the table. You bring something to the table. And um, that's really cool. So now it's all of a sudden I have this network that's continuously growing and meeting a ton of great people. And I can introduce them to other great people I've met. And that's just the power of networking, I suppose. Right. Um, well, I guess, I guess what would be your advice to any person? Like, how do you get out of your own head with the content? Cause I know that's rough. Yeah. Um, I think if you're looking to create content, I found that consistency is key. You know, you never want to put out something that's trash, but I feel like a lot of people get caught up and I have to create something that's perfect and super niche and, and you you'll will kind of run out of stuff to talk about. So you kind of have to blend that in with, um, for me at least with like current hot topics or trending topics, something that people are look researching online that they're interested in. Um, but the biggest thing is consistency because the first yeah. eight months I did YouTube, I posted one to two times a week. Mostly it was one time a week. And I had like 80 subscribers in the first ten, eight to 10 months. I think it was 10 months. And then I took a course on creating YouTube content and I learned about consistency and improving you know, content, things like that. And I posted two to three times a week consistently the past like three or four months. And since then I have gone from 80 subscribers to almost 2000 subscribers. So the consistency thing was the biggest part. Like you don't know what piece of content is going to really, sh you know, strike home for people and they're going to like, and it'll start to not blow up, but reach more of a broader audience. Um, so for me, that was, that was the biggest thing. Just be consistent and just try to put out the best content possible. And I think also one of the things I preach is like, understand the platform that you're posting on and understand the consumer of said platform, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what you post on TikTok might not be what you post on LinkedIn, right? And like yeah. understanding, like you, you got to understand like the me mechanics behind it and who's consuming it. And then you tailor your message towards them, correct? Yeah, for sure. And it's funny you bring up TikTok. I kind of softly made fun of TikTok for a while, just because what most people think, oh, it's just people like doing dance videos. And that was... I will never make like in my, the back of my mind, like belittle like a social media platform that has that type of potential and reach. I did it as an accountability group with a few people who are also in real estate and post on LinkedIn, whatever, you know, podcasts. For me, it was YouTube. So we said, let's post one TikTok or Instagram reel per day for a month and see what happens. And for me, it was try to be a funnel to YouTube, but I ended up building a, an audience on TikTok, like 33,000 uh, followers, which is insane to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I wish I could get that traction on YouTube, but TikTok is just so powerful and how quickly that you could build an audience. Um, and you're right. It is different because it's a different consumer. Not all those people are going to want to go to YouTube and watch content or go to a podcast and listen. Um, so you're right. You have to kind of cater 
that content, even if it's the same information, you got to kind of mm -hmm. twist it to, to fit, to fit that platform. And what, as you write out your goals and you look at the rest of the year, I know you're, you're knee deep in a project right now and the Airbnb business is growing. Just curious where your, where your wife and you see it going and, and, and how big you want to get it. I mean, I know you don't have the firm answer, but I'm sure you have an outline of where you're headed. Yeah. So um, we, we would love to do some traveling. That was kind of the biggest thing for us before we start um, trying to have kids. So our goal for us was to become financially free, which, you know, thankfully we reached a couple of months ago. And then from there, we wanted at least one more rental, if not two to three this year. So this is our first one this year. Um, and then after that, for me, it was once I'm able to monetize on YouTube and some of these other avenues, um, I'd love to probably part ways with my W2 job. Hopefully my boss doesn't listen to your podcast, but um, that would be a, a great moment for me and for her as well. So we can um, go and, and do other things in our life. And we don't think Nashville is a forever home for us. So we'd love to travel around the U S and explore and see the national parks and, and honestly just see where we want to potentially plant roots and, and start a family. So we wanted to do that before, you know, popping out some kids and being a little bit more tied down. Yeah. We, I just did that this last fall, uh, late summer. I went to like 12, I think 12 oh. national parks. How was that? Uh, I'm obsessed with Utah. I think Utah is amazing. Bryce Canyon. Oh my God. We went there on accident and I'm like, still can't get it out of my mind. Um, uh, Oregon beach coast was amazing, but I'll be honest with you. I just had a client close uh, a million dollar piece of property on a lake in Montana. It's 50, 40 minutes away from Glacier national park in Banff, which is my fate. My number one, I haven't been yet. My number one. So he's like, Hey, can you come out here in like a month? And I like, I, like stay for a week and help me design. And I was like, yeah, I think I'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll I, I love Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, yeah. those States. I just, I'm, I'm in love them. Now I don't love the winners that thank God I always have a place in Texas or, or Costa Rica, but, but, but um, it is, you know, you're living what we preach and you're basically becoming a lifestyle investor. And that's, you know, that's my kind of phrase I, I took from somebody else, but it's kind of something I live on. And the, the you know, and, and we guys, we didn't share a ton of the bad stories. But there's good with bad, obviously, but, but, but your mindset is one that this is where I'm headed and, I, you know, we'll just get over everything we want to go. And so, you know, it's going to be weird when, when your kids go, well, that – why is dad at every, every uh, event? It's because dad <laughs> made some good choices and he's an investor. Like that's what you want your kid to say to everybody else. Like it's awesome. Yeah. I think the biggest mentioned before aha moment for me also is with the stock market, I invested some money in, but for me, I just didn't fully understand the investment or, you know, the how to assess risk. So that's why I liked real estate was I, I understood it better and it was a tangible asset, like a physical asset. Um, but for me, the risk thing, I was reading a book called uh, Cashflow Quadrant by Robert mm -hmm. Kiyosaki and he starts defining risk is, well, what's riskier? You know, you think you have a nice, safe, secure job that pays you benefits and stuff. But I mean, what happens if you get let go? And sadly, that happened to a ton of people in 2020. If you don't have any other income coming in, you know, what do you do? how quickly are you going to run out of money? Cause you have a car, you have a house to pay for a rent. So for me, it was, is it riskier to just invest in a 401k or IRA and hope you have enough money to retire at 65 ish? Or is it, are you willing to take on risk when you're younger and invest and set yourself up to do whatever you want with your time from 30 to 60 or somewhere in between there, you know? So that became, I was like, it's way riskier to not invest and not get into things like real estate especially now. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Yusuf Lee, uh, one of my buddies I interviewed uh, released on Tuesday. He's a lawyer in New York who's a multifamily investor trying to get out of his W-2. He said something to me that really struck a chord with a lot of people. He said, you need to wake up and realize that you're working three to four months out of the year at your W-2 just to cover your taxes. Oh, yeah. And that'll make you realize that that whole year is not your year. 
Like, yeah. so if you don't have assets to back that up, to get depreciation and to fix your taxes, then you're, you're, you're basically working against the grain uh, for those months. You might as well just light that money on fire because it's not going towards what you need to go to. Yeah. And then how much time do you have left to do stuff that you're actually passionate about? I mean, I used mm-hmm. to go fishing like four times a week and this is part, part choice, part I've been busy, you know, with work and investing, but I mean, I haven't been fishing in the past like 10 months and just mm-hmm. like being outdoors. So that's like the big thing for us is I want to get back to doing stuff that we really enjoy and we're passionate about that comes back to having time for it. So right now it's about building and creating that time to do stuff that we love to do. hundred percent. And so if people want to find out about your YouTube channel and all your other stuff, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, you could YouTube my name, Michael Elefante, and um, probably find my channel there. And you could find me on TikTok and all those other fun platforms as well. Um, I'm Elefante6, but... (laughs) Well, guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends. And we really appreciate y'all listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.